so, um, yeah, yeah. 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 So you guys are smarter than we are because you know this is Oh, 
on his entire body with eventual development of extensive bullet. What is the next step in treating this patient? I'll give you a clue. This is, you have to think beyond my topic. Anybody have a clue on diagnosis? So let me give you the option for treatment. So stop factor malopurinol ibuprofen and start IVIG. Stop factor malopurinol ibuprofen and start antihistamines and systemic steroids. Stop back to my malopurinol ibuprofen and start burning on the IVIG. Stop back to my start off with steroids. Please. Please. What do you think of the diagnosis? The answer is correct, but you think this is SGS? This is not SGS. This is generalized bolus fixed corruption. Um, I Put it out there just because you need to uh, understand different types of scars. Um, so, and uh, um, antihistamines and systemic steroids can be used for uh, uh, GBFD, and uh, there are uh, many other forms of uh, you know, a skin diseases that can look like SGS. Um, and hence, it's important to understand simultaneous adverse drug reactions. Uh, they are diverse clinical phenotypes and uh, mechanisms of even offending drugs. As you can see, these are the different forms of uh, stuff. But for today, we're going to talk about SGS and DM. 
Because globally, SGSTM and DRESS syndromes are the two commonest uh, clinical phenotypes. And DRESS is a little more common than SGS, which is 1 to 4 in 10,000, and SGSTM is 1 to 7 in a million. Um, in HIV patients, the prevalence is much higher. It's about a thousand fold high, uh, which is 2 in uh, 1,000 in HIV patients. And they all have T-cell mediated immunopathology and strong HLA associations. So in this picture, you see the estimated prevalence of major scar clinical phenotypes in different countries. And you can see that aliferinol is the highest offending uh, agent in Europe, China, and uh, USA, followed by aromatic anticonvulsants, uh, which include phenytoin, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, and uh, phenobarbital, followed, followed by um, antimicrobials, uh, which include cotramoxazole, quinolone, cephalosporin, sulfonamides, and oxycam essays. And what really drives this specific offending agent to be more common in a uh, certain, con uh, certain country is the presence of the high-risk HLA um, allele. Um, as you can see, um, HLA B57 uh, over is more common in uh, the in USA, India, and uh, Europe. Uh, that's responsible for abacavir. And uh, um, HLA-15 O2 is um, uh, much, much more common in uh, China and uh, the Southeast Asia that's responsible for carbamazepine and used uh, HAS and TN. In this picture, we, uh, you see the HLA associations with uh, you know, various types of uh, drugs. Uh, but uh, uh, for now, um, Abacavir, uh, HLA ali 5701 uh, that's associated with Abacavir and 1502 with carbamazepine are the only two FDA approved um, uh, G testing available. As you can see, the negative predictive value for all of these are pretty good, but the positive predictive value is not that great. And the number needed to treat is large for most of them. I just figured out um, uh, uh, Dr. David Coyle from ID. He just shared uh, an unpublished uh, data on vancomycin induced address syndrome uh, and, uh, from Vanderbilt University, and that's involved. Um, uh, that's associated with 3201, uh, HLA 3201. So uh, the number needed to treat uh, looked like it was 84. So there are other non genetic factors uh, that are responsible for uh, the severe drug reactions, uh, which are concomitant dietetic use, uh, high dose in pre existing renal impairment, and uh, especially in allopurinol hypersensitivity and underlying malignancy and SME. Um, so all these uh, causes likely lead to decreased clearance, increasing the risk of reaction, which is also supported by a cytochrome uh, P452C9 enzyme, which has shown to reduce drug clearance, uh, which is a genetic factor, genetic risk factor in phenytoin related scars. Uh, there's also ABC drug transporter and proteasome pathway uh, mutation seen in SJS and TN. Um, so what causes the immune response? Um, such a uh, you know, severe immune response in scars. So this is uh, according to uh, heterologous immune response. Uh, it requires the presence of um, HLA risk allele and a primary uh, HHV infection, which leads to generation of, um, uh, which when presented with a T cells, there is generation of uh, effect on memory cells, which persist in the tissue for a long time, for, uh, for extended periods of time. When the patient is exposed to a drug, the drug, uh, in association with an endogenous peptide, stimulates these T cells, generating uh, 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 effect on memory T cells. So this can happen in three different, uh, uh, according to three uh, hypothesized models. One is the heptan pro model, where the drug binds to an endogenous peptide covalently, which then can be recognized by the uh, T cells. Uh, the second model is the PI uh, model, where the drug uh, binds to the drug that can directly bind to T-cell receptor or the um, MHC. In the third model, the altered peptide repertoire model where uh, the drug can bind to the MHC <coughs> binding site, altering the uh, peptide structure of the MHC, which can then be recognized by T-cells. So pathogenesis in SJS and TN is occurring in epidermis where keratinocytes act as the antigen presenting cells. They press, uh, once that is recognized, once the drug is recognized by the T-cells, um, um, those are mainly cy cytotoxic pieces in uh, SJSTN, which then release uh, perforin, granzyme, and granular lysine, uh, which causes the destruction of epidermis, uh, causing separation of the dermis and epidermis. 
In Dreck syndrome, the pathogenesis occurring, is occurring in dermis. Uh, the main cells that are involved are uh, CD4 and CD8, um, and uh, they mainly cause release of uh, TNF alpha and interferon gamma, and there is also viral uh, reactivation. We can see uh, cytotoxic T cells involved, involved in SGSTN and uh, CD4 or CD8 cells involved in what is dress syndrome that causes uh, various types of manifestations. A little bit about viral reactivation in dress. As you all know, HSG6 reactivation is seen in 43 to 100 percent of the patients, which is which happens typically around two weeks <coughs> after the onset. Likely, uh, it's considered a likely coexisting factor than a causative factor, and there are two possible explanations. One, uh, the cytokine storm. In HSG6 patients, uh, there is um, it's found, uh, found that uh, low, there is low level of pro-inflammatory cytokines, including TNF alpha, interferon gamma, IL-1, IL-2, IL-6 in early stages. And there's expansion of TREX and TH2, which suppress antiviral immunity. And there's also, um, this is also evidenced by the elevated TARP levels, uh, which expand TH2, and uh, uh, there is reduction in uh, plasma cytoidendritic cells, reducing, uh, further reducing the antiviral immunity. The other explanation is the direct effect of drugs or metabolites on viral reactivation. In one of the in vitro studies, um, it was found that amoxicillin could induce HHV6 replication in human T cell uh, T lymphoblastoid cell line. Um, let's talk about SGSTN. This was uh, first described in 1922 uh, by Dr. Stevens and Johnson as a new eruptive fever that was associated with stomatitis and ophthalmia, and this was reported in children. Uh, was later classified uh, based on the percent of body uh, surface area with epidermal detachment. Uh, SJS is less than, uh, involves less than 10% of the uh, body surface area. SJS TN overlap is 10 to 30%, and TN is more than um, more than 30%. That's um, extensive. So the latent period for SJS TN symptoms is 4 to 28 days. Hence, it's very important to take history. Uh, um, of all the drug exposures within the past four weeks. Um, the symptoms are often prece uh, preceded by fever, generalized uh, general malaise, and non-productive cough, stinging eyes, and sore mouth, often confused with URI, and they rapidly progress to an exanthem on macules and uh, uh, targetoid lesions, epidermal detachment, bullae, and erosive mucositis of at least two surfaces, uh, which uh, usually starts within three days, and you can see Nicole's key sign where you uh, rub the skin and there is a um, detachment of epidermis from dermis, and the early painful erythema of the palm cells is the major feature of SJS and TN. The hallmark feature of SJS and TN is uh, the presence of mucosal involvement in 80% of the cases, are usually uh, more commonly in oral lesions than ocular or genital. As you can see, the uh, palms are involved. There is extensive uh, epidermal detachment in TEN um, that's here. And you can see the ocular um, and oral lesions. So SGS TN can help long-standing devastating uh, uh, sequelae. It's not only on skin, but uh, organs like eye and genital urinary uh, tract and um, um, or GI tract due to additions and scarring, and it can have uh, chronic lung disease, and uh, one should not forget the psychiatric complications, which include anxiety, depression, and even PTSD. So what's the prognosis of SJSTN? Um, if it's extensive, uh, it can uh, go up to 50%. Uh, as you can see, um, at six weeks and uh, three months, uh, over 20% of, uh, there is, uh, the mortality is over 20%, and at one year, because of long-term complications, uh, you, you can steal 30% uh, mortality up to one year. Um, so the prognosis can also be determined, determined by a uh, validated scoring system called SCORTEN. Uh, this is used by most of the studies, uh, you know, looking at different types of therapies and everything. Um, and the pro this is a predictor of mortality if, uh, if you calculate it at day one and day three. And this includes age over 40 years, malignancy, heart rate of more than 120, initial epidermal detachment of more than 10%, uh, elevated urea, glucose, and uh, bicarbonate. And a prompt withdrawal of the offending agent has shown to reduce the mortality by uh, approximately by 30%. Uh, quickly on SJS in children. Uh, the true incidence is not clear in children just because erythema multiforme majors can look like SJS TN, and the high percentage of uh, 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 
high percentage is non drug related, and mycoplasma pneumonia and um, HSV is commonly associated, is associated with EMM, and similar drugs in, are involved if it's a drug induced um, SJSD in children. As you can see, these are the differential diagnoses for um, um, SJSTN, um, and uh, this table shows uh, the differences between SJSTN and uh, TN and EMM and uh, uh, generalized further form of uh, fixed drug eruption. I skip this slide for the rest of time. So, coming to dress syndrome. So, the latent period is two to eight weeks for uh, dress syndrome. And uh, you can typically see articaria like wax or, um, on an egg or an exanthem. Other clinical phenotypes are vesicles, pustules, chelitis, purpura, target adhesions, or erythrodermal have also been reported. And you can often see fever and edema. This is particularly uh, described as puffiness rather than an angioedema. Uh, sometimes it can be confused with angioedema. Um, you can also see lymphadenopathy, leukocytosis, eosinophilia, and atypical uh, lymphocytosis. And as, as sometimes the long-standing severe lesions, lesions are characterized by extensive scarring uh, that's referred to as exfoliative dermatitis. Um, and when when you see the patient in uh, initially, you can you know confuse this with a you know, benign drug exanthem. But when could this be a drug and not just a benign drug exanthem? When uh, the fifty percent of the body surface, when the more than fifty percent of the body surface area is involved, if there is severe edema, infiltrated skin lesions, or scaly erythema and purpura, you should really suspect dress and uh, monitor, monitor for any uh, organ involvement. So organ involvement is seen in more than 90% of the patient in, uh, patients in dress syndrome. Uh, more than two organs are involved in uh, about 50 to 60% of the patients and uh, liver is the most common organ. Um, you can see a uh, cholestatic picture versus mixed versus hepatocellular uh, uh, picture and uh, according to Regiscard criteria, which I'll be uh, talking about in a little bit, uh, more than two times the liver enzymes are involved is suggestive of dress um, and alkaline phosphate is more than 1.5 times the upper limit. Um, kidneys are less often involved than uh, liver. Uh, you can see elevated creatinine, low-grade proteinuria or abnormal uh, urinary sediment with occasional um, eosinophils and lungs are um, uh, even less common. Um, you can see non-specific cough, fever, sharpness of breath, or hypoxia and you can see CT evidence of interstitial pneumonitis and Pure effusion in some people, and uh, BL, uh, you can find CD8 cells. There are other organs uh, that can be involved. Uh, mucosal involvement is seen in 50% of the cases in breast. It's typically single site uh, versus SJSTN. Uh, it's more than 90% uh, of the time, it's more uh, two sites. Uh, you can see the involvement of heart uh, uh, in the form of eosinophilic myocarditis, pericarditis, gastro uh, gastrointestinal. Uh, uh, diarrhea, bleeding, pancreatitis, uh, thyroiditis, and even encephalitis, myositis, and uh, polyneuritis and uveitis have been described. So Registcard is a, 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 a European registry that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that has come up with the uh, criteria for the uh, diagnosis of uh, dress syndrome, uh, which looks at fever, enlarged lymph nodes, eosinophils, atypical lymphocytosis, a skin rash, uh, with an extent of more than 50% of body surface area, the rash resistive of dress um, or um, um, organ involvement um, um, as uh, a different criteria. As we can see, uh, it's, it, 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 it is a scoring system. Uh, at least two to three points is suggestive of a possible case of dress syndrome, and more than five is considered as a definitive uh, case of dress. So what's the prognosis of dress? Uh, dress uh, prognosis is not as bad as SJSTN. Uh, the mortality is uh, still 10%, um, uh, and uh, the most common causes are liver failure or secondary infection. Uh, one of the studies showed that at three months, 22% 22 22 of patients still had symptoms. At six months, 13% uh, of patients had symptoms. At one year, 9%. And you can have long-term sequelae with breast syndrome as well. Um, the, you can see skin dispigmentation, xerosis, and autoimmune manifestations, and you can see um, uh, 50 percent, uh, in more than 50 percent of the cases, you can see autoantibodies, and you can have um, long-term complications like renal failure and uh, even psychiatric complications like uh, PTSD, anxiety, and uh, depression. So I had one patient uh, during residency who did have autoimmune thyroiditis after the dress, and I, you know, she did have uh, thyroid antibodies for a long time, long time, uh, joint pain, and, and nobody could. So you need to be aware of these and 
What, Mahari, why the delayed time course in dress? Or is it usually it takes a couple of weeks before it manifests? I think it's because of the the way the effect of um, memory cells are you know, dividing, and there is uh, around two weeks there is a suppression of there is a, a production of T Rex, and I, I think it's something to do with the T Rex and uh, CD4, CD8 cells uh, before they you know, divide and uh, cause manifestations. That is a characteristic feature that's different than SJS and PEA it's later. And cytotoxic uh, T cells, as soon as they present, that maybe they can cause release of ranulocytes and perforin and plants and maybe a tree and T cells. Okay, so how, how do you diagnose and manage SJST and Andress syndrome? Like anything in medicine, I think it's uh, uh, it's important to take detailed history, uh, uh, in, uh, and it's important in figuring out the causative factor. And one should uh, try to understand or establish the medication at risk and risk causality. Um, you should look into the day of onset of symptoms and determine the index date as the first day of symptoms and time since the drug was taken. Um, as we just discussed, the interval between exposure and the scar onset, uh, uh, you should have an idea about this. It's generally short for Egypt, uh, less than three days, intermediate uh, for SJST and uh, it's four to 38 days and block butter syndrome. Um, for drugs with a long half-life, you should, uh, um, the drug that was taken even before the onset of uh, the symptom should be considered. And you can see, uh, you can uh, use different types of algorithms uh, for drug causality. I'm not going into details of that, but uh, it's uh, real time. So there are in vitro tests, uh, uh, like lymphocyte transformation test and enzyme-linked uh, immunospot assay, elispot assay, to detect the drug test specific T cells, uh, especially in uh, lymphocyte transformation test. And uh, you would also look into release of cytokines in elispot. Um, LTT can be positive in one month after the reaction, uh, which is uh, around five to eight weeks for dress and uh, or within a month for SJSTN. And uh, elispot can be done earlier than um, Earlier, earlier stage after the scar onset. Um, so LTT has shown some promise in dress syndrome or agent, but it has low relevance in SGSTM, and LSPOT is considered to be more sensitive, that's 80% uh, than LTT, and it can detect uh, the drug specific pieces through uh, drug specific release of uh, interferon gamma, interleukin 4, and granulocytes in production. You can also look into other biomarkers, including eosinophilia, granulolysis, and perforin, interferon gamma, um, individually, soluble uh, fast ligand, and, and CD69, or in combination, maybe it's better to do it in combination, um, uh, but they are all far uh, from ideal. Um, as you know, in breast syndrome, you can uh, detect several types of uh, viruses, including HH3, 6, 7, 8, CMV, and EBV in 60% of the patients. Uh, which is positive in about two to four weeks, but not helpful in the initial diagnosis. Uh, this is only uh, you can suggest a drug syndrome. Drug provocation can be done if you think the benefit outweighs the risk, but uh, we do not commonly do this. Um, but uh, the genetic uh, testing can be done uh, only in, in, in some cases, like a bipolar and problem with it. And uh, uh, doing genetic testing in Southeast Asia, Asia especially, as nearly, uh, nearly eradicated carbamazepine induced SGS and TN. And as you know, the number needed to treat is pretty large for most of the age. So, whenever there are multiple drugs and the clinical phenotype is unclear, you can uh, consider patch testing. So, a few points on patch testing. The current guidelines recommend the patch testing between six weeks um, and six months after the resolution of cutaneous drug reaction and at least one month after the. Uh, uh, discontinuation of the oral steroids, and it has to be done uh, less than one year, because uh, if you do it later, the patch testing can be negative. And there is uh, there are a lot of European uh, papers are, uh, with patch testing, but I didn't find a lot from uh, um, the US. And I, particularly, these three papers are pretty helpful. One is a review article, uh, and uh, uh, the next one I'm going to talk about is a multi-center prospective study. Um, and the patch testing can uh, be useful to determine the cross reactivity for, you know, if you have a therapeutic alternative as well. So, this study is the uh, 
I think this is the largest study, uh, which is a prospective multicenter study, uh, which had 134 patients, and they used 22 to 30% dil uh, uh, dilution in the uh, uh, petrol atom. And uh, they did delayed, delayed patch reading. If the patch test was negative, they also did intradermal testing with delayed reading, especially in dress and Egypt, and uh, which yielded uh, additional positives. For SJS, if the uh, one percent dilution, they did one percent dilution. If it was negative, they did thirty percent dilution as well. So overall, there was a seventy-six um, patch test positive for one thirty-four patients. That is around fifty-six. Uh, 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 56 percent uh, in dress syndrome. In dress syndrome, the patch testing was more commonly positive, and also in Egypt uh, compared to SJS. And uh, the uh, good thing about this paper is that they tested for all unusual suspect, uh, suspects, including PPIs and uh, radio contrast media and corticosteroids, and and uh, they uh, found that it's safe to do the patch testing because it really reduced uh, rash only in uh, one 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 case. As you can see, as you can see in dress syndrome, uh, they had uh, 46, 64% uh, uh, positive uh, positives and uh, beta lactams in uh, in uh, among the antimicrobials were the most common one. And in non antimicrobials carbamazepine was the commonest one. And I think you should look at this. The proton pump inhibitors was responsible for five cases. So we often, you know, overlook this. I think we should consider um, these as suspects as well. Did they comment whether that added anything to the history? Did they have a suspect drug before they did all this work and did they actually learn something from it? You know, when they challenged, some of them did have uh, the rash, or with, you know, and that was correlating with the patch for some of them. Like PPI, steroids, and things like that. I don't think this gets done in the U.S. So. I think we should consider this. <coughs> well, you're saying they, they challenged them after the patch test. Yes, for some of them. I mean, they didn't challenge. Uh, no, sorry. Um, they didn't give them the drug again. No, I think for some of the negative patches as well, when they gave, you know, proton pump contributors, for example, they, had, they ended up having the rash. Some of the patients. So in a previous study in Portugal, uh, they uh, there was only 32% positives, but they only used carbamazepine, anticonvulsants, and allopurinol. Um, but uh, this study specifically included all unusual suspects, and hence the higher number of positives. And it can be un unhelpful in uh, cases of salazopirin and allopurinol, and this is also uh, corroborated by previous studies that allopurinol can be notoriously negative. Um, in, in dress syndrome, multiple drugs can be positive, which is uh, unique to dress syndrome, uh, which you should uh, you know, remember or keep in mind. In SJS, there were only four uh, patients positive, uh, uh, that's Lamotrigine, Tetrazepam, uh, Gramipril, and PPI, and uh, patch test does not seem to be sensitive. Uh, in, in one of the previous studies, only two pa patients out of 22 was uh, previously positive, and, uh, and it uh, seems to depend on the drug. And I briefly about Egypt, even though we are not talking about Egypt, uh, that a large number of uh, positives can be seen in Egypt as well. And the most common um, drug is beta lactam and uh, uh, beta lactams. And uh, delayed uh, patch reading and intradermal testing and delayed uh, intradermal reading can be helpful to find out additional positives as well. well go back just for a second. It's striking they have corticosteroids being the offending one in eight cases. the drug we treat people with, not that we induce the disease with. Right. Anybody else's experience match that? I don't think many of us see these diseases. The dermatologists take care of it, but uh, that's striking to me. Egypt is very rare, uh, but we, I recently saw a patient who was on eyewear and developed uh, uh, generalized contact dermatitis. And uh, everybody kept saying, you know, she also has contact dermatitis with a lot of other drugs, and everybody kept discarding. And we did patch test for true test, and she was positive to uh, multiple steroids. Um, so that, that's that pretty pretty con con on. contact dermatitis with topical steroids with no one. But no, it can have a generalized system, though it was not contact, it was a systemic reaction. 
was it all just standard 48 hours application fetch tests, or does it look at longer on the screen? Two days and four days, in some cases, delay. I'm not going into details of this paper, but uh, for you, this is a 2017 review, which uh, I guess there are different studies. Uh, this was published in Journal of American Academy of Technology, and they also uh, say the same thing that uh, touch tests can be found in about 30 to 60 percent of the cases in breast syndrome, and uh, much less in SGS. It cannot be the SGS in breast syndrome. Coming to the treatment, uh, the main um, treatment is supportive care uh, that's critical, and uh, one should. Uh, Think about hydration, nutrition, or wound care, and appropriately triaging the patients to ICU or burn units, depending on the, um, the initial uh, scotton. Um, and uh, multiple specialties should be involved, and pain management should be uh, strongly considered. And uh, another important aspect is prevention of long term complications. Amniotic membrane transplantation has been performed, uh, if performed early in the course of disease, uh, has, has shown to um, decrease uh, scar or eye complications. Uh, that has to be performed within seven to ten days, and um, one should also um, uh, concentrate on preventing adhesions and fibrosis in genital mucosa, and uh, consider use uh, using the uh, adjunctive immunomodulatory therapies. So I looked at looked into multiple multiple studies, um, whether steroids are better, IVIG is better, or anything else that's helpful. But uh, the consensus has not been reached. Uh, the initial studies with prednisone showed a higher rate of complications, including sepsis and mortality rates. But later studies showed some promise, and especially in this study, with the uh, largest uh, meta-analysis, including uh, uh, 1,200 uh, patients. But all these studies are cohort studies, uh, retrospective, prospective, or um, unclear in 70% cases, and uh, only uh, one RCT that was with alidomide, which showed, showed increased mortality. And they mainly looked into supportive care, glucocorticoids, IVIG, cyclosporin, and uh, the other treatment modalities that, uh, that are described here. Um, steroids, uh, in this study, they, like, they looked into 11 studies comparing uh, steroids versus supportive care. Overall, there was a trend towards a benefit of steroids and reduction in mortality, but it was not statistically significant. Um, uh, the, the bottom line is that uh, it can be beneficial, but it's still inconclusive. It is commonly given. We don't know what's the dose. Uh, it could be one to two milligrams or a high uh, pulsed dose. Uh, we don't know whether it's combined uh, uh, steroids with IVIG is better. Uh, but one should be cautious that in cases with extensive skin detachment, uh, there is increased risk of catabolism and decreased epithelization with steroids. Um, with IVIG, they also looked into seven, nine studies uh, uh, comparing it with supportive care, but there was no difference in mortality. And uh, multiple case series and meta-analysis and systematic reviews have failed to demonstrate a statistically significant survival advantage, uh, even though it's often used with steroids. And it seems like a reasonable approach, uh, but along with uh, optimal supportive care, and you need to be cautious in either the renal and Thrombotic or uh, uh, cardiovascular risk patients. Um, I found several studies on um, um, cyclosporin, and this was recently presented uh, during Quad Area as well. Uh, that it, it has shown a lot of promise, especially um, in 2018 meta analysis, uh, uh, including 255 patients with TN. Approximately, it reduced the mortality by 70%. Uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, mechanistically, it should make sense that cyclosporin. Decreases the T cell activation and it can benefit some patients. Um, also, the uh, TNF inhibitors, including infliximab and Anderset, uh, has also shown promise in the recent uh, studies. Um, some studies have shown IVIG plus steroids is better than um, uh, using uh, using them by themselves, uh, but we don't have a strong data. Um, uh, this study was interesting that uh, they looked into a 74 year old uh, female with. Uh, uh, with patient with extensive TN, uh, they gave infliximab IVIG plus steroids and skin condition stabilized in day two, and there was rapid improvement and successful discharge uh, on day 19, and there was no sequelae at uh, nine months. So one should you know, consider TNF inhibitors or such as potents. And plasma paresis has been looked into in some patients, but we don't have a strong data. This slide summarizes uh, 
whatever you just discussed and uh, coming to treatment of dress syndrome uh, the, the dress syndrome should be treated until all the inflammatory parameters and uh, the systemic uh, disability are resolved um, without organ involvement uh, you can use high potency uh, topical steroids but with systemic steroids uh, if there is a life-threatening inflammation or organ involvement, uh, irrespective of viral uh, reactivation, system steroid should be used. And with liver injury, there is no consensus on uh, steroids, but for renal and uh, lungs, uh, steroids may be of value. And there is lack of evidence for IVIG, and some people even looked into antiviral therapy, uh, but we don't have a clear data on that. And uh, the key in dress syndrome is the long-term follow-up uh, that's required to manage the organ. So for dress, uh, corticosteroids in dress, there are uh, no uh, randomized trials, uh, mostly are uh, retrospective uh, studies. In a series of 60 patients, uh, the death rate was similar in patients uh, treated with steroids or without steroids, and uh, the usual dose of prednisone is 0.5 to 2 milligrams, and you need to continue it until the clinical improvement and the normalization of laboratory uh, parameters, and then taper it over 8 to 12 weeks. Um, there are other treatments. Uh, of with case reports on um, cyclosporin, cyclophosphamide, rituximab, mycophenamide, and antivirals, but uh, there are only few case reports and they are not routinely recommended. And uh, uh, you should um, do the labs every week uh, at least, uh, until it is normalized and also the skin, skin and other organs. Another case uh, a two year old uh, develops a pruritic or fragile rash on the stomach and a low grade fever while being treated. At Osteomyelitis. Uh, she is uh, she's otherwise playful and otherwise well appearing in the office. However, her she the PDP showed use of in a, use of PDN um, with absolute use of the count of thousand. What's the appropriate course of management? Would you withdraw vancomycin immediately hospitalized? She's not completely hospitalized. Um, for IV steroids and in, uh, initiate alternative antibiotic to treat the infection. Would you withdraw vancomycin? Treat the rash and pruritus with oral steroids and antihistamines as an outpatient. Initiate alternative antibiotic and continue vancomycin and treat the rash uh, with oral steroids um, or withdraw vancomycin and treat the rash and pruritus with topical steroids and oral antihistamines um, and initiate an alternative antibiotic. And what should we? How long should they be receiving the vancomycin? What does this kid have? Okay, this kid has a dress and wrong, um, but not organs are not involved yet, looks like she has this syndrome and you should stop vancomycin and since this hasn't involved any organs, she's otherwise looking okay, we are just giving her antihistamines and uh, the topical steroids. She doesn't need the criteria or qualify for oral steroids. Okay. Alright, can I, so I'm surprised that Bactrim hasn't come up in your presentation. Because I also see Bactrim as causing um, some of these bad cutaneous reactions, I mean, especially, of course, in HIV positive patients. I, I didn't go into your details on all the drugs, but you know, in one of my earlier slides uh, with epidemiology, Bactrim did come up, but I didn't expand on all the drugs. It, it's definitely much, much more common in HIV patients. And in, among the antimicrobials, Bactrim is the uh, common cause. I think they didn't, I don't know if they use a lot of Bactrim in Europe. In the patch test, they do. Study. They do use a lot because they actually use it for gram negative bacteremia, which is the way we don't use it here. At least in the patch test, they don't use it. In uh, dress syndrome, any case reports yet on anti eosinophil therapies? Uh, Try case reports? I didn't come across any for um, anti eosinophil therapies, but there are other monoclonal. A couple of slides back, you mentioned patch testing, but you said you had to patch test on involved skin. You couldn't patch test on uninvolved skin. 
Is that what you find with patch testing for these drugs? So for Dress syndrome and SGSTN, you can uh, patch test on, on uh, any, uh, you know, the uninvolved skin. But for fixed drug, uh, drug eruption, you should particularly concentrate on um, the, the previous lesions. I think in some of the SGS cases in the paper, they did do the patch testing on uh, the involved skin. In summary, um, so whenever you recognize SGST and, and uh, breast syndrome, uh, you need to withdraw the drug immediately, and that has shown to improve mortality. And supportive care is the key, and prevention of long-term complications should recognize and treat and involve multiple specialists. And uh, I think um, I will at least consider patch testing at uh, six months uh, follow-up on these patients, especially on unusual suspects as well. Um, I haven't done it before, but I'm planning to. I just want to show you one slide and I want to see if anybody can detect the error in that slide. Tell us the gender, did you? No, I just said 56 year old patient. So. I did not. Yeah. <laughs> I was just waiting to see Um, uh, 
um, and environmental exposure, specifically harm, how they affected development and affected inmate in the system, which is uh, maturation. Um, so I have. Association of early life farm exposure with uh, various health benefits. For the wealth study, are the association of early farm life exposure with um, decreased rates of allergic disease, including asthma, which has been shown in a number of independent first cohort studies in Europe. Um, but also more recently discovered association of early life farm exposure is decreased rate of severe respiratory infections that require medical attention in the first two years of life. So shown here are results of one such study. This was done in a, a retros the retrospective study of a school-aged children of Wisconsin um, who either did or did not have uh, exposure to farm environment in the first five years of life. Um, and then through retrospective either questionnaires or a review of uh, EMR, um, the study found that the prevalence of uh, both allergic disease, allergic rhinitis and eczema, as well as early like, respiratory infections, has been decreased um, in, in, in the farm exposed children. And to, uh, the reason why um, we are interested in looking at this effect on farm form effect on respiratory infections is not, not simply because it would be beneficial to have less uh, illness burden in the first year of life, but uh, also because respiratory infections are one of the known uh, one of several known factors that do contribute to development of asthma. Um, and this project is really part of a larger set of studies that is trying to um, uh, determine how farm exposure uh, may affect some of these previously defined risk factors that we know about. Exposures. So not, not all farm exposures are the same. So several independent studies have found that there's really three types of contact with farm that result in different health outcomes. And those include regular contact with livestock, specifically cow spit and poultry, um, regular animal feed contact, like side, which is hay, silage, or feed grain, and also regular farm cow's milk consumption. Um, in terms of looking specifically at what farm exposure affects the rates of respiratory tract infections, Less more, uh, fewer studies look specifically at that, but one of them um, did find that farm milk ingestion um, was associated with lower rates of respiratory tract infections in the first year of life. And this milk would have been consumed either in raw, um, uncooked form, or boiled. Uh, this was a prospective first cohort in Europe um, looking at the children who either were or were not exposed to farms. Now, how farm exposure leads to these different health outcomes is still under investigation, but uh, the immune function is one big area of investigation. And studies do suggest that early life farm exposure may affect the immune function. I summarized the most notable studies here, and the one consistent thing among them is that um, they do point out the importance of innate immune cell responses through toll like receptor signaling pathway. So um, both in cord blood from farm infants, as well as peripheral blood from school-aged farm children, which um, live on farms, um, they did have, um, several studies did not increase the expression of uh, TLR, various TLR, uh, MR, uh, MRNA for different polite receptors, but um, how, that, how that results, uh, how that affects uh, polite receptor induced cytokine signaling and, and downstream um, health outcomes is still under investigation. Um, and another piece of background information for my project was that, that um, there are significant changes in TLR induced cytokine production in early life, especially in the very early life. And so um, it can be expected that if environmental factors affect um, the in the immune function, 
exposure to the internet early life is important in sort of setting them up for how they'll function later in life and affect um, health of the affairs of the person. The summary here is not looking specifically at our next goal, but as a compilation of a number of studies that look at the bulk of the, of the function of TR and just cytokine production in a, in a variety of studies and systems. So, based on this background information, the hypothesis for the project were first that early life arm exposure is associated with um, differences in inmate immune cell maturation, and that early life arm exposure is associated with a more robust antiviral inmate immune response. So, the, to address these questions, we worked with the Wisconsin Infant Study Cohort. It's called WISC. Um, it is an ongoing prospective first four study. Um, in Wisconsin, where the recruited from the Marshfield area, which you can see is in the middle of the state and has a large proportion of dairy farms, but also um, non farm environments. So, uh, in the study, we did have prenatal prena recruitment of mothers who either worked or lived on dairy farms or in, lived in a rural non farm environment with goal of recruiting 100 infants in each study group. Um, and there are some exclusion criteria, including maternal youth on antibiotics, as well as prematurity and serious perinatal infections, congenital anomalies, and respiratory distress after delivery. Very briefly for the demographics, there was no significant difference, differences in the number of children in the household, mode of delivery, um, whether or not they were breastfed, maternal smoking, and also maternal history of allergic um, disease, asthma, and topic dermatitis. All of these uh, have been previously associated as uh, uh, potentially affecting um, uh, development of allergic disease in a child. Um, there was a significant difference in dog and cat ownership, but when, when, um, uh, when I accounted for the amount of time the pets spent indoors, there are more males recruited to the study at this point, um, and uh, as expected, the farm group um, did have a higher rates of maternal consumption of the farm, farm milk during pregnancy, which is an important um, piece of information for our study. So, for my project, I evaluated the immune maturation in first year of life, um, and this was done by uh, analyzing blood either obtained from pork and pork at birth or peripheral blood uh, at one year. Uh, we iso isolate monoclear cells and they underwent stimulation with a number of stimuli. Um, and I was specifically focused on LPS as an example of bacterial um, uh, uh, response and rhinovirus as an example of antiviral response and then analyzed the response of the, of the DNA cells by flow cytometry. So um, we first defined the immune cell, cell lineages based on accepted pattern of surface lineage marker expression. Um, and for my project, I focused on uh, uh, monocytes, myeloid dendritic cells, and plasma cytoid dendritic cells. Um, and then we, for, for the three cell types, we defined the immune cell phenotype using a combination of surface and intracellular um, uh, marker staining. Um, so for the surface, oops, for the surface markers, um, we use a, a series of maturation markers either relating to antigen presentation or to stimulation and intracellularly stained for a number of cytokines. And then we use this phenotype to assess the maturation status of the cell. So the, the, the diagram on the far on, on the right is a simplified um, illustration of immune cell maturation using monocytes as an example, where um, the cell's cell starts off being immature and as it matures, it will um, in, have increased expression of various maturation markers, but it will also um, have increased production of cytokines, either more, more of a given cytokine and also more different types of cytokines that are produced by the cell. So um, I will uh, next move on to the results. And first, I will show simply the age related differences in immune cell phenotypes, and then finish with showing some of the early life arm exposure associated differences. So, um, the, we did find significant 
and change in how the team themselves pay for these and networks you apply. <coughs> uh, most of the is an, an decrease in uh, frequency of monocytes and increase in number of B cells. Um, and so when we down the line we look at the differences in genome type, we actually exploded the frequency, the, the, the differences in frequencies because they were more significant than anything else. Um, to actually look at the difference in the differences in immune cell phenotypes, so the one that we're comfortable with before that we took all of the flow variables um, that were significantly different in more than one year, and then were clustered based on the, the similarity of level of expression, and so we did obtain a cluster of variables that was uh, had higher expression in the cord, um, and then a different cluster of variables that had higher expression in, in one year, showing up here in yellow. Um, I'm, I'm not listing, so each row is a different immune variable. Um, I'm not listing them in, individually, but in, in general, the um, variables that had higher expression in the cord were more consistent with immature phenotype, and those expressed in one year more consistent with, with mature phenotype. And we found similar type of clustering shown here for rhinovirus stimulation for all cell types, uh, but also um, with LPS stimulation. So um, we wanted to look further what are the most significant differences seen um, between the age groups. Um, so are those the same markers you're showing on both heat maps or uh, the so, ones specific to rhinovirus or LPS? So we use all of the markers for MRI, so they're the same. Um, so you're showing all markers yes. on those heat maps, okay. Um, this is just, I, I won't, this is a busy slide, but so like the greatest age associated difference that we found in general was the pattern of expression of the CD40 and CD86 um, activation markers. And I just want to just focus on the, on the, on the four, first row and the second row for, for each different stimulant. There is a significant difference in, in the pattern of the expression. We wanted to know what was the, most, the greatest in terms of false change between the one year and also what was most consistent between, between the different markers. And so this turned out to be an um, increase in proportion of CD40 positive CD86 negative cells um, at one year of age, um, both with rhinovirus stimulation and LPS stimulation, um, and for all three cell types. Um, uh, but additionally, we also um, found that a significant difference in increased increase cytokine response to rhinovirus and LPS at one year compared to cord blood. So um, for, for plasma cytogenetic cells, as, as expected, this, as these are the most, uh, the most robust responders to rhinovirus infection, the, the biggest difference was seen in increased production of interferon alpha and TNN alpha at one year. Whereas for monocytes and myelogenetic cells, there was significant increase in production of IL-6 and TNF alpha in one year. So, uh, are you comparing and contrasting farm kids from non-farm kids? So this was, are we looking at here? So here, this, this up to this point, I was just showing uh, just all, all children all together. Children. So the next slide is actually we're about getting to the farm exporter um, association. So um, we want to see if, if that showed any further differences between groups. Uh, so contrary to what we expected, we actually did not find an association of farm exposure with difference in cytokine response to rhinovirus. Um, there was also no difference in, ma in the maturation marker expression, which I'm not showing here. So as you can see, the percentage of cells producing interferon alpha and TNF alpha were the same regardless of farm exposure and mostly high frequency. Um, but we did find a significant difference um, in response to LPS, so with farm exposure at one year, specifically monocytes did produce more IL-6 and also more TNF alpha in the farm group here in the red, um, but there was no differences in the cord blood. And then looking more at this response, uh, another marker of the response being more mature um, in the in the farm group was that um, there are more was increased proportion of uh, monocytes producing multiple cytokines after LPS stimulation at one year. So the number of cytokines is the same shown here on the x-axis. So most notably there was more cells producing two um, cytokines in response to LPS. Um, 
also small, smaller percentage of cells, like those that don't even produce the most protein, and two cytokines, and then secondly, fewer cells that produce them. So, in, in summary of these results, we did find that for age related differences, regardless of farm exposure status, um, there was a significant change in the pattern of maturation marker expression and more mature cytokine response to both rhinovirus and LPS at one year. Um, and in terms of farm exposure related differences in the first year of life, we did find more mature cytokine response to LPS at one year, but no differences in response to rhinovirus. And this study is still ongoing, but one, one way we, we uh, think what we think that our results suggest is that there is an immune system maturation and during the first year of, of life, and with farm exposure, it results in a more mature response to LPS, perhaps, I mean, most likely due to ongoing stimulation with some of these farm specific exposures. Um, and then the study will look further into what clinical outcomes are in this group, but one of the speculations is. Perhaps the differences in the um, incidence of severe respiratory infections that are seen in the farm may relate to more protective response to bacterial pathogens as opposed to antiviral response. Although there are still many other aspects of the antiviral response that have not been well known um, for. I just want to acknowledge my mentors, Dr. Sehuli um, and Dr. Brand, and the co authors. One thing, I don't know if you and Jim have thought about this, but when you have such a strong delta from birth to one year, rather than just looking cross-sectionally at each time point, look uh, at the delta. Because if you look at your interferon data, actually it looks like there's a trend where the uh, non-farm exposed kids were higher or you have more outliers who are high in the cord blood and it reverses to some extent uh, at one year, the left figure there. And specifically looking at delta and the within individual change could be could be very useful. Did you find any differences between your studies and similar studies in Europe? So there isn't. I mean, with the studies specifically in different, we look at specific different cell types. So there isn't really one that's right compared to um, the the one thing that's is different from couple of studies that I was six. In, in, in some studies, it has shown to actually decrease um, from birth to to one year. So that's one of the things we are seeing. But farms are the same in both both countries. Yeah. Well, do you negate the the TH two population? No. So this was not. The only markers we had are the ones I have showed. Um, but it's not really part of the population. There's, there's another part of the project that looked at DMX, so a different way of looking at cytokine production, so we're outside of that. Yes, it, it, it would be just, it'd be interesting to get like on that CD161 population, the TH2 effector thing, especially for development of asthma in this group. In the. I, I went to interesting talk by Percelli from Arizona where she was talking about the epigenetic imprinting in during pregnant during the uh, pregnancy was the major determinant in their Arizona asthma population of asthma development at age five. You know, the the most significant exposures were occurring in utero. Small sample analysis looking at epigenetics, and they didn't find a difference in this in this particular population. So unresolved. Yes. Yeah. Very nice study. Um, thank you for sharing it with us. This some of this echoes the data that's available on BCG um, in infants um, and mortality in Africa. Mostly those studies come from. So it turns out that BCG, uh, when given at birth, protects from uh, early child, early infant mortality, but not from TB. 
it protects across the board from all infections, mm -hmm. suggesting that it has a very similar sort of in, immune maturation um, effect mm -hmm. as the farm exposure. So the story feels like it's coming together. It's not thought to be reflective of the adaptive immune response, but it's just that you know, strong immune stability is very early in life. You have other? No, I just was wondering about the microbiome of your live on a farm and that right. could move these things together in some yes, and so, okay. um, yeah. I'm, I'm not part of the study here, but another Lewis study is more comprehensive and so the analysis of microbiome was it's good for school and skin um, is part of the event. So something we put together. Well, and to that same point, in the inner city kids, they've shown, Jim has shown that actually higher exposure to LPS by a cockroach is protective mm -hmm. uh, and they have a bunch of microbiome data on that as well. Um, so it may not be farm specific, but uh, this innate immune stimulation early in life. So all kinds of filth in early life is good. But <laughs> 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 so my main question is, at the University of Wisconsin, how do you refer to yourselves? U of W subscription? <laughs> We're the U dub here also. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just Any more questions? Um, I think I was wrong on re challenge, but they re patch tested. They didn't re challenge. I would hope not. Yeah, I'm going to 
So, um, from one of the people who was monitoring out in the lobby, that he says Zoom is much easier to work with. So we should do that routinely. Yeah. Uh, so we'll get the microphone thing worked out for next week. Um, whatever you did when you stepped in here, correct it. Did you shut off? I wish I had time? thought about it. No, I wish I had thought about it beforehand. Honestly, I just wouldn't grab an extra USB mic and I plug it directly to here. I was thinking about how we could solve it for the, the, the microphones in the room to, to support everybody. Hello. <clears throat> uh, because I know that you often ask questions and things like that, so I was trying to make sure that I caught everybody. But okay. it seemed more important to me to try to, to get the, the person giving the speech to be louder. And you did. We did. By, by putting this in, we were able to do that. For this. Um, so what do we the, micro, the microphones, I, those will be rectified by next week. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have an appointment with the tech to be in here already. It's it's some kind of technical glitch, and I have no idea what's causing it, but we'll get it fixed. Um, right. Because the other microphones are picking up. These ceiling microphones are picking up. But it's not ideal if people are out there crinkling sandwiches and stuff because they can't hear the person. And, and the person speaking here is the farthest person person from the microphone. So, so, so this is essentially not working. They, they were working yeah. in the room, but they weren't feeding out the call okay. for some reason. Okay. So we're going to get that figured out. It's probably just a programming issue, and we'll have to rectify that. And so, <laughs> so to use Zoom going forward, is every week just will just be a different uh, HTTP connection? Is it specific to... Each week's talk, like the one you sent yesterday, is that universal? 